And that's where I'm afraid this document is heading to, because it calls for a rewriting of uh, some of the teachings of the First Vatican Council. There's an attempt to say we can have a decentralized form of the church in which basically the Pope is an honorary leader. He has an honorific supremacy and primacy, but that uh, each group in the church will be able to give its own interpretation of Catholic teaching and what it means to obey. That's very dangerous. Today, I'm going to have Father Gerald Murray back on the show. I want to get his take on the whole Bishop of Rome document that broke last Thursday, I think it was. We talked to Dr. Anthony Stein about that. You can catch the podcast on our website, by the way. By the way, my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. You might recall just last Thursday, the uh, the dicastery for Christian Unity uh, released a document, a study document called The Bishop of Rome, Primacy and Synodality in the Ecumenical Dialogues. And in the responses to the encyclical Ut Unum Sint, Father Gerald Murray, happy Father's Day to you. Thank you for your time today. Let's get into this document. It, it is a very long document. It, this, I think it's one of the criticisms that people like myself tend to have about documents that come out of the Vatican. What is your initial response to this document, just on like the how they wrote it, the kind of language and the themes that they used. Well, the document has two parts. One is sort of a summary of all the responses that Orthodox and Protestant dialogue partners, as we would call them, uh, had to uh, ut unum sint, uh, the document of Saint John Paul II about unity in the Church. And it's basically a resume of years and years of meetings and papers that were submitted, uh, objections to uh, Catholic claims, uh, Catholic attempts to explain those claims in a way that would uh, mollify or answer some objections. So that's the first part. That's quite lengthy. Uh, and then the second part is a proposal from the Vatican about how to proceed in further discussions. Um, regarding uh, essentially the position of the Pope in the church and focusing really on two central questions, papal primacy, uh, papal jurisdiction, uh, papal infallibility. So these uh, are, are, we would call them hot button topics for non-Catholics because they reject papal primacy, uh, jurisdiction and infallibility. So how does the Catholic church try to uh, convince them that uh, they should be united to the church and accept those realities. And that's where we get into some, let's say, problematic proposals for solutions um, that will require uh, some serious analysis from theologians and canon lawyers. Something we've talked about on this program on a few occasions is the sort of the 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 current times we live in and the ultra montanism that we tend to find you know enough you know every syllable that's ever uttered from his holiness pope francis uh, is is to be taken you know as uh, 100% infallible and that kind of thing it, this kind of feels like it may be swinging to the opposite end of that spectrum so it doesn't feel like a middle ground here is that fair how did you see that well, yeah, ultramontanism was a movement in the church in the 19th century to defend papal prerogatives against civil governments uh, and also, you know, forces in the church that were trying to deny the papal supremacy, uh, a heresy called Gallicanism, which was basically saying that, and conciliarism, uh, these positions were that the pope depended on other authorities to exercise his own. Um, as regards, you know, its position and, and the way the Holy See speaks, um, we're in an area since the Second Vatican Council where the approach to non-Catholics changed. Rather than simply uh, expressing Catholic truth and calling people back to unity, the idea was, well, the Catholic Church is going to explain better her teaching and as a result make it more attractive for people who are not Catholic but believe in Christ to be united to the Holy See. That's a worthy goal, but it should never be confused with a political negotiation. And that's where I'm afraid this document is heading to, because it calls for a re-reading or a re-analysis, even we could say in reality a rewriting of uh, some of the teachings of the First Vatican Council. I think a lot of critics are believing that this is trying to 
circumvent the First Vatican Council or sort of, um, you know, reinterpret it to the point where it almost uh, doesn't exist anymore. Do you think this document is trying to accomplish that? Well, it's it's paying attention to uh, a point of view that um, certainly the fathers at the First Vatican Council will say, well, that's the reason we issued this document, because there are people who deny papal authority and people who deny the uh, prerogative of infallibility uh, given to St. Peter and his successors. Um, the issues at, at stake, though, are crucial because um, there's an attempt to uh, say we can have a decentralized form of the church uh, in which basically the pope is an honor honorary leader. He has an honorific supremacy and primacy, but that uh, each group in the church will be able to uh, give its own interpretation of Catholic teaching and what it means to obey. Uh, that's very dangerous. And certainly, um, you know, we want unity with the Orthodox. We want unity with our Protestant brothers and sisters. But unity is not the supreme uh, measure of fidelity to God. Truth is. Uh, what is the truth that Christ revealed? How is it to be understood? And what is the motive for believing in it? That's what's important, not whether each group which has broken off in the past uh, can now be reconciled on the basis of maintaining their own independence. You know, as human beings with limited intelligence, uh, we are not the source and font of truth. We are the discoverers of truth, and the Church progressively over time comes to a deeper understanding of the truth. So to view uh, Vatican I as problematic because non-Catholic Christians object to it uh, is to short sell the Church. The Church is not a political organization that issues policy statements to, designed to convince people to cooperate with it. Uh, the Church is Jesus Christ's mystical body teaching. Uh, what our Lord said to the Apostles applies to their successors. He who hears you hears me. So the goal of the First Vatican Council and of it, all the councils is to teach the truth and call people to the obedience that we owe to the truth. This document seems to press for the synodal process to become um, the law of the land, not just some pens, uh, passing fancy of this current pontificate. Is there a concern here from your perspective? Well, you know, it's only been a year and a few months since we got the notion that synodality in the church means that lay people have an equal voice with bishops when it comes to uh, voting on recommendations to the Pope. Uh, synodality is radically altered under this pontificate. The Synod of Bishops dropped uh, the name Synod of Bishops, became the Synod, in the lead up to the uh, the synod that's still ongoing, this three year process. So, you know, in, in orthodoxy, you do not have lay people voting at synodal meetings uh, when the patriarch assembles his fellow bishops. You do have that in Anglicanism, and uh, that the Catholic Church has viewed uh, not favorably because uh, it, the idea that. Uh, Church, decisions on church order, doctrine, and policy implementing the, the defense of the faith, this depends on getting lay people, representative lay people together to vote along with their bishops and priests. This is not how the church is organized. This does not reflect the apostolic nature of the church. So yeah, I have a lot of, synodality is basically an undefined category in the church because it's a novelty that's based not on the sacramental order but on the Pope's statement, he says, well, you know, there are no second-class citizens in the church, he said, when he said we're going to invite women in to vote with equal, member, equal membership in the synodal assembly. So a lot of confusion here. And as regards decentralization, uh, we've had really the opposite under this Pope. He said that at the beginning. He said he didn't want a top-down church. Uh, but he is exercising authority that canon law and the Second Vatican Council had granted to bishops. You know, perfect example was uh, a local bishop could form a religious community in his church, in his diocese and granted approval. He simply needed to inform Rome that he was doing it, and Rome changed that. Now the diocesan bishop cannot form a religious community in his diocese without approval from Rome. It's a small but significant example of how centralization has happened under this pope. If he's calling for decentralization, if he's calling for synodal process, then it's, then how do we understand this type of behavior, this type of pattern that we see? It seems like it's talking out of both sides of their mouth. 
Well, it's difficult to reconcile the notion that uh, we are going to uh, appreciate the role of the local bishop and not treat them simply, as some did in the past, as vicars of the pope. Rather, they are successors of the apostles. They can only exercise their authority in communion with the pope, and the pope gets to appoint them, remove them, uh, and guide them, and even discipline them. Uh, so, you know, the, the, the organization of the church has its sacramental roots, um, and that's manifested in how canon law is organized. Now, on a practical level, uh, when you have Bishop Fernandez in Puerto Rico and Bishop Strickland removed, and I can maintain without proper canonical process, then you are basically saying the will of the Pope is the supreme measure of, of whether a bishop can exercise his authority. And the answer is no, uh, the Pope and the bishop are likewise bound by revelation and canon law, and therefore only when the order, good order of the church is threatened and a canonical violation has occurred can a bishop be summarily removed. But even then, canonical process and rights have to be observed. But uh, that is not how things are done now. And it's, it's regrettable because Second Vatican Council never envisioned that this would be the, the development of the relationship between the pope and the local bishops. So this is a study document. What can we expect next? What will happen after this? I would say not a lot on the immediate uh, horizon because uh, the way the ecumenical dialogues are organized is done by groups. So you have dialogue with the cops, dialogue with the Greeks, dialogue with the Russians. I mean, you have all these different meetings that go on, and that's reflected in the, in the document, which cites you know, the records uh, and the reports coming out of these different meetings. Uh, we have, therefore, probably going to be years ahead of responses to this. Now, on a political mm -hmm. level, you can't, it's hard to understand what, where things will go because this notion of where the Bishop of Rome relates to the Petrine office and supreme authority, that will also be argued out in other circles. Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between. And we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way. So make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.